About 299 million years ago, the Carboniferous period would come to an end, leading to uh, the next geological period known as the Permian. Now, you may have heard some people say sometimes, hey, it's not like it's the end of the world or anything. Well, it turns out that you probably couldn't have said that at the end of the Permian, because about 252 million years ago, the Permian is going to end with something that is referred to as the Great Die, the single greatest mass extinction event in the history of life on Earth. But in between, life is going to change dramatically, most notably in response to the climate change that occurred at the end of the Carboniferous period. We're going to see the rise of, a, of whole new groups of species, both in terrestrial and aquatic environments. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video, so stay tuned. About 299 million years ago, the Carboniferous period ended giving way to the Permian. And the Permian period would last for about 50 million years until about 252 million years ago. Now, the Carboniferous period did not end with a major mass extinction event. There was the Carboniferous rainforest collapse that emptied out many of the forests. In fact, some of the forests disappeared altogether. Now, many of the seedless plant species would go away as the climate became cooler and more arid during the Permian period and towards the end of the Carboniferous. But what species remained at the end of the Carboniferous largely are what dominated the forests of, that remained during the Permian period. However, by the end of the Permian period, we would see the majority of these species actually get replaced with more modern species, such as seed ferns and actual early conifers uh, would begin to actually show up uh, and exist in the end Permian forests. And we're going to see that turnover occur uh, as the as the Permian period uh, drags on. Now, of course, the Permian period is also taking place after the the formation of the supercontinent of Pangaea. And if you recall, Pangaea was a single supercontinent. It was shaped a bit like the letter C. And the coastlines were much more habitable than the interior, which was essentially one large central desert based on the archaeological and geological evidence. The coasts, of course, were battered by uh, super tsunamis and, and all kinds of other things that weren't necessarily fun, but at least they had access to water and rain and were significantly more moist. And this is where the majority of the forests lived. Now, there were some forests uh, that would actually exist during the Permian period that actually remained unchanged from what was seen in the Carboniferous. But these forests were largely in island habitats. And I bring this up to you not to mention that some plants from the Carboniferous hung around a lot longer than most others, but to point out that even Permian Islands were weird. Uh, if you went to Permian Islands, you would see species that had gone extinct on the mainland tens of millions of years before, yet persisted in these island habitats simply because they were the last bastions of the Carboniferous Earth in terms of their climate and their moisture and their temperature. Not much in the Permian Ocean changed in terms of what was going on with sea life. Um, there wasn't a, the, the, the extinction events that happened towards the end of the uh, Carboniferous didn't impact aquatic life nearly as much as it did terrestrial life because it was more about being cooler and drier. The oceans were still very wet. So we still see mollusks, brachiopods, um, trilobites were still a dominant force on the ocean floor. Uh, crinoids were still around. And there, um, if you look in the water column, we're still seeing lots of different mollusks, ammonite fossils, um, which closely resemble modern day nautiluses, um, were quite abundant during this time as well. Uh, fish species remained relatively constant. On land, the like I said, towards the end of the Carboniferous, this was going to be the end of amphibian dominance. It was the reptiles that were going to take over, uh, and they would go through an adaptive radiation, filling a lot of the niches that were occupied by the formerly dominant amphibians. Uh, amphibians that still remained remained almost almost exclusively in aquatic and semi-aquatic environments. Uh, terrestrial niches were almost entirely occupied by reptiles as we moved into the Permian. Insects were becoming an increasingly dominant species on the planet Earth. So insects started to appear uh, uh, during the Devonian and then uh, into the Carboniferous, but uh, still weren't major components of terrestrial ecosystems. At the beginning of the Permian, most insects were, uh, were cockroach-like with folded wings, but we'd start to see during the 
uh, Permian period, we start to see early damselflies and dragonflies begin to appear. Uh, so we're starting to see insect species that more closely resemble uh, modern species start to appear at this point in time. Another example of this would be the appearance of the first beetles. Uh, beetles are actually such a common species on the planet Earth right now that if you went species by species, I, I think somebody once said that there's like a 50-50 chance that if you just picked a scientific animal name out of the book, there's a 50% chance that it's a beetle. That's how dominant beetle species are on the planet Earth uh, at this point. Uh, but this is where we first see them appear during the Permian. But like I said, uh, one of the more amazing stories is what was happening with the reptiles. Uh, as I said, the large-bodied amphibians largely went away at the end of the Carboniferous as the climate trended to be uh, cooler and more arid, disfavoring the, the aquatic necessities of the amphibian body plan. The amniotic egg, the ability to breathe through lungs instead of through cutane cutaneous respiration, significantly favored reptiles in most terrestrial ecosystems. And what we start to see is the divergence of several different groups of reptiles uh, heading towards uh, distinct evolutionary paths. For example, if we look at the synapsid lineage, the lineage that would eventually give rise to all modern mammals, uh, the ones that have a single hole uh, behind their eye socket uh, that's lower on the head than the eye, than the, than the eye holes. Um, the palicosaurs uh, were, were very common during this time, um, uh, during, the early, uh, during the early Permian period, as were a group, no, uh, a group of species known as diadectes. So diadectes were actually the first terrestrial herbivores. If you recall, all amphibians and reptiles up to this point were strictly carnivorous. Uh, diadectes uh, would be the first group uh, of, of, uh, of reptiles identified in the fossil record as having a strictly herbivorous diet. As we go through the Permian period, uh, we see more advanced therapsids or better adapted therapsids start to take over these ecological niches from diadectes, uh, from the plecosaurs, and we start to see species like the gorgonopsids and the dicynodonts. Uh, these would get, begin to replace those earlier reptile species later on during the Permian. By the very end of the Permian period, we see the appearance in the fossil record of the first archosaurs. So archosaurs are important because archosaurs are the species that would eventually give rise to all dinosaurs and eventually all modern day birds. At the same time, we see the appearance of the cynodonts, which um, are the, the last sort of reptilian ancestor uh, of, of all modern mammal species. So what we see towards the end of the Permian in the fossil record is we see the roots uh, of what's to come on planet Earth. We see the progenitors of dinosaurs and then eventually of of all birds, we see the progenitors, fur-covered reptiles uh, of all modern mammals. And these are already in place towards the end of the Permian. But the Permian ends with the single greatest mass extinction event uh, in Earth's history, where somewhere between 95 and 97% of all species on the planet would go extinct. The causes of the Permian mass extinction, also known as the Great Dying, uh, remain, remain somewhat unresolved. However, a decent amount of evidence suggests that there were, was widespread volcanic activity that occurred kind of all of a sudden. And what ended up happening was a massive amount of, of harmful gases and toxic substances were released into the atmosphere. There was huge pulses of carbon dioxide that would have led to uh, rapid global warming. There was uh, massive amounts of sulfurous containing compounds that would acidify and poison the ocean. Uh, a lot of the evidence from this uh, suggests that th this volcanic outburst actually came from the, uh, the part of the world that is now modern day Siberia. And there are these things called the Siberian traps, uh, which are vast um, stacks or, or strata of, of Permian rock uh, that, that is the result of, of these, these massive volcanic eruptions that completely transformed the planet Earth. And following the Permian mass extinction, the mass extinction that occurred at the end of the Permian, or the Great Dying, um, impacted life so strongly uh, that it took almost 20 million years for life to rebound following the Permian mass extinction. It was such a profound extinction event that even the insects, which were not bothered by any previous or subsequent mass extinction event, the insects were actually dramatically hit. That is how rapidly and how devastating Devastatingly, the Earth was transformed by the events that ended the Permian. 
The Permi would end forever any hope of the amphibians ever regaining their status on planet Earth, and it would change the Earth dramatically. What we're going to see as we move out of the Permian period, the species that remain, the few species that remain on the planet Earth, as this is the single closest event that ever made it that life was almost completely extinct on the planet Earth forever. Those few species would go through a long but massive adaptive radiation. The oceans, the land, and the air was gonna, will be transformed. And what's interesting is a single group of species would become the dominant species for almost the next 200 million years. It would be the reptiles that would go on to inherit both the land, the sea, and the air. And for almost 200 million years, reptiles would dominate the planet Earth like no species has ever before and ever will after. That's what's coming up next when we move into the Triassic. As you can see, life was transformed greatly during the Permian, recovered nicely from the minor extinction events that followed the end of the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. Reptiles began to dominate the terrestrial environments for the first time, and we continue to do so, as we will see following the great dying at the end of the Permian. The single greatest mass extinction event in the history of life on Earth occurred about 252 million years ago at the end of the Permian, wiping out all but about 3% of species on the planet. It's these 3% that would inherit the entire planet in all of its ecological niches. That's what's going to happen when we talk about the Triassic period coming up next. I hope you learned a lot. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.